And Bill, you served in the Vietnam War. Uh, which branch of service? I was in the Army. What was your highest rank? During the Vietnam War, I, my highest rank was first lieutenant. When I retired, I retired as a major. Which general locations in Vietnam did you serve? I saved in general, served in uh, Quang Tri Province, which included the, the towns from the south as far as uh, south as Da Nang, then up up the highway to uh, Phu Bai, Hue, Quang Tri, and to the west, Khe Let's talk a little bit about how you got in the service. Were you drafted or did you enlist? Yes, I was drafted, and <clears throat> after college I had got my deferments for some college, and then I got drafted, and I decided that I didn't want to be in a combat situation, so I enlisted for stock control in the county. And for that, I, w I went down to uh, South Carolina and did basic training out of that. Do you recall the year when that you were drafted? 1968. And where were you living at the time? I was living in Meriden, Connecticut. Oh, so you're from Connecticut. Yes. Now, when you got your draft notice, at that point, you had the option of enlisting instead of being drafted? Right, right. I chose to enlist. And why did you choose to enlist in the army? Hmm. I never thought of that question. Is I, there I, a reason you chose the army? <clears throat> Actually, I I had tried uh, fairly hard to try and get into a res reserve unit all along the East Coast, and I chose the army. Uh, Actually, that was the only open for me. I, my father was in the Navy. I wanted. I probably would have wanted to do that, but I don't know if that was available to me. Uh, interesting thing. I got my draft notice on a Friday, and on Monday, I got my notice that I could go into the reserve unit in uh, New Jersey or something like that. <laughs> it was just too late. Oh, wow. Where did you go for your basic training? I went to uh, uh, South Carolina, Fort Jackson. Did you tell me what that was like? Um, it was a real enlightening experience. I remember it was the first time I'd ever been on an airplane. And which was an exciting part, but I remember at the time it's a, it's a real, uh, you know, you're, I don't know, I was 19, 20 years old, and it's a, it's a, it's a tough experience, I thought. I mean, I, I physically I could handle everything I needed to do, and mentally I, nothing bothered me there. It's just that being away from home, uh, girlfriends and things like that, it was a, a different experience, and you all of a sudden you realize you're in another world. You know, it's a... It's a, a world where people aren't very nice to you, and yet at the same time you have to learn what they what they have to teach you. Do you recall any of your instructors from basic? No, I don't remember there. Um, I, I don't. No, I don't. I don't recall anyone. How long were you down in Fort Jackson? I was in Fort Jackson for just the period of basic training. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if that was six weeks or eight weeks, I can't remember. After that, I went to AIT, Advanced Individual Training and in Stock Control and Accounting at... And where uh, was that? That was in Fort Lee, Virginia. And in Fort Lee, uh, I finished my classes in Stock Control and Accounting, and then I went, I got the top 3% of the class, they went to go to, I think it was automotive repair parts or something like that. And I, I, I went to another school in AIT after oh, that. So wait, AIT went to Stock? Control? Stock control in the county. What is that? It Stock was. Control it, it had to do. In the county? Uh, yeah, it had to do with computers. It, we were dealing with the little uh, the cards. Remember in the days we had cards for computers, and uh, that was the area that I was trained in. And then from that, I went to automobile repair parts specialist, which was the same thing. We were controlling parts for um, army equipment. Pretty boring. Did you get to choose what you would be trained in, or did the Army choose for you? Uh, once they chose for me after I got my, after I finished AIT, I got promoted to Spec 4, and because I was chosen out of the top three of the class, they sent me to another AIT. That's how I got that. So the other AIT was the automotive repair? Yeah, yeah. Was that at Fort Lee also? Yeah, it was Fort Lee. So how long would that be? Another eight weeks? I'd say it was probably another eight weeks, yeah. Something like that. Maybe less. And how did that 
differ what additional things that they teach in the automotive repair? It wasn't, it was pretty much the same thing. It, it, it had to do with uh, computer uh, tracking of equipment. I guess I should know because I passed the class, but it, you know, I quickly forgot it afterwards. It wasn't anything I thought I'd ever use again in my life. Uh, all I didn't even know where it was going. I just know that I'd be responsible for ordering repair parts for Army vehicles. Did you know anything about vehicles? And no, no. That? I didn't know anything about it, and I really didn't need to know. I just needed to know if someone put a, a, an app in for a part, I guess I was supposed to order them or something. As I said, not not real expired. Now, you already had your college degree? You had yeah. already graduated? Yeah, yeah. What was your degree in? Uh, marketing. <laughs> Nothing, nothing that you were doing in the Army. Related. No, no. <laughs> um, after your second AIT with the automotive repair parts, where did you go? Well, it was during that period when I realized I was making, I was taking home, I think it was $87 a month. I was struggling and someone approached me because I had a college degree to go to Officers Candidate School. So I gave it some thought and I said, yeah, that I, I kind of like to do that. And I applied for uh, artillery. Uh, and and then after I finished AIT, I became what they call holdover. I mean, I, here I am waiting orders to go to something else. You would call it what? A holdover. Oh. Uh, there were a lot of people in that category waiting to go to another program or something. And and I was a uh, at the time I was promoted to sergeant, and I was in charge of troops, just taking them to classes while I waited for orders for officers candidate school OCS. Why what? did you choose artillery? It just seemed fascinating to me. I, I don't know. It just seemed like something I'd like to learn about. Uh, if I had to pick an, ar uh, an, arm, an armed uh, combat arm, that's one I chose. Um, and it was going down to Oklahoma sounded like a place to go, so I did. Interesting thing, as I'm waiting for my orders for Fort Sill, Oklahoma, um, apparently they cut orders and couldn't find me, and so I didn't end up going. And when they discovered the, 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 the mistake, they cut orders for Fort Benning for infantry, for which I went. I mean, So I, you didn't even get to go to Fort Sill? No, I never went there. And you didn't get to go in the artillery? No, not at all. It's not like I didn't get to call in artillery fire, but I mean, it was, it, I thought back at, years later, I said, you know, here I was in Vietnam calling in artillery fire, doing everything I would have done had if I had been in artillery. Without the training. Yeah. So you went to Fort Benning, Georgia for infantry training yes. as an officer. I was going to be, yes, that was uh, training to be an officer. Do you recall what, what year and month that was? Uh, not too sure. I think it was, it was in 69, 69, maybe the end of 69 somewhere. That was uh, probably the toughest thing I ever had to go to up to that date. The officer, it was worse than basic? Oh, yeah. It was, it was um, I think it was, oh, was eight. I don't know if it was, well, we went for maybe, I want to say six months, maybe. I'm not sure. I may be wrong about that. Is this the program where they consider you a 90-day wonder? No, no, that's a, that's a whole <laughs> that's a whole different thing. Yeah, 90-day wonder was. That would be three months. Yeah, that was that was a different thing. The different ways of becoming an officer in the services would be to go to one of the military academies, and for a four-year degree, you get your commission. Uh, another way would be to go to uh, the reserve program. In college, and you can graduate, uh, and then you go to an advanced course in your branch to get commission, and then of course there's field commission. Then the OCS was the other way, and most of us in OCS were all uh, enlisted men that had been selected to go to officers candidate school. So I actually spent a period of time as as an enlisted man, which I think was really good for me later on. So tell me about your OCS training, what it was like, what kinds of things you learned, what was your daily life there? Uh, OCS is something that, um, let me start by saying that there were 450 guys in our battalion that started out. And as you go through the program, there's many opportunities to quit the program. In fact, they encourage you to quit. Um, 
we would have people that would, if you failed a class of some kind, they would rotate you back to a, another program, you know, so you would still continue, but you'd get a chance to take that class over again. So a lot of, there was a lot of people that were, were held back, and then there were guys who quit. And very often, if you were harassed by the officers during the day, you'd come back to your bunk and there'd be a letter on there, all typed up, all right, just, just quitting. And you sign it and all of a sudden they're nice to you. And then you had a week, I think, leave and then you went to Vietnam. But you went as a spec four. You, you, get, you got some guys, it was a promotion. But of the 450, I think, original, um, only 109 of us graduated from that program. I remember that number. Out of the 450? Yeah. No, I mean, we graduated a full battalion. But, I mean, of the original guys, there was only 109 of us. To tell you, I mean, the attrition rate's very, very high. As, and that, uh, looking back on it, it should have been. Um, the training is, is very physical and very mental also. There's a, they try to break you down. Um, and I think all the, through this time, I mean, maybe I was a year older than some of the other guys or within a year older than some of, some of the guys. And that certain that didn't hurt that I was a little bit more mature, as, as much as you could be at, what, 20? And <clears throat> I, uh, the program itself is, as I said, very, very physical, uh, many opportunities to break down, many opportunities for um, working together with other guys, which is w what they wanted to see us do, and leadership was key. And as the program goes on, I'll give you an example, you run from the time you get up to the time you go to bed at night. You're not, as a, as a, as a beginning person in OCSU, are not permitted to walk anywhere until I think it was maybe our 18th week. And then they have what you turn, it's called turning blue. You're, a, you're considered a third lieutenant. You get, you garner a, a salute from younger people, and but then you can start walking. <laughs> but you can you can see where we were in pretty good shape. You know, I remember going there in the beginning, I think in the first week I was in a, we ran, we ran to Alabama. It was 13 miles total, total trip. Now, when I say ran, we, you know, we ran in, in formation, and uh, I think it was more or less a confidence thing to let people know that you could actually do it, you know, and it worked, you know. Among the things that I thought were wonderful there, <clears throat> they had leadership classes, and uh, the, the infantry uh, training was just really superior, but they had training classes there, and in leadership, and I remember one, of the, one or two of the classes one week, uh, which were all day classes, um, were taught by Medal of Honor winners. And I'd say, I think it was five or six of them, and none of them were really healthy guys. You know, they had all lost a limb or something, but I'd say we listened to those guys very well. I mean, it was really a wonderful experience for me to see these guys and, <clears throat> and hear experiences of their tour in Vietnam similar to what we're doing now, you know, and it was interesting because it wasn't, it wasn't the war that you see on television. It was a war that you see a guy talking about up there. And we learned about various aspects of leadership. And it was during that period that I realized that, you know, this is it. I'm going there. You know, it, it just, it, it occurs to you all of a sudden that, that, wait a minute, this training is really important. And as much as you try to survive from day to day, it, sort of took a turn for me. I said, well, I should start paying really good attention. I mean, I graduated in the top of the class, but it was really only because in the end, I really thought I should really learn things. And it was because of that that I went on to Ranger and, and Airborne in school. Did you know when you were at officer training that you'd be going to Vietnam? Did you figure that out? <clears throat> well, we, we got this here from other classes, and the guys would get their orders, and they all went to Vietnam. I mean, we all knew that was going to happen. We're infantry officers. That's where they were. We were needed. Uh, infantry officers didn't fare well in Vietnam. Um, we were, in the beginning, we would wear rank on our collars. But you know, near the end of the, I know in the hundred and first, we we didn't wear any rank. You know, the guys knew who was in charge, and that was we were just in the field together. And consider this: that I remember thinking, you know, I'm going to be. It didn't occur to me when I my first went to Vietnam that. Here I am in charge of 45, 44 guys, and I'm 21, 22 years old, and I'm leading them in combat. I said, what were you guys thinking, you know? 
but I had some great training, and I, I attribute being here today to the training, and um, and those guys that were with me, they should know that they're here because of some of my training. Um, <clears throat> when you graduated from OCS, what rank were you? Second lieutenant. After your graduation, where did you go? I stayed in Fort Benning for Airborne and Ranger School. That was by your choice or the Army? That was my choice. You I, wanted to become yeah, a Ranger? Yeah, I, I said, I started thinking I need, I need to be trained. You know, that was, it's important, you know, I, I, I heard too many stories about guys that did stupid things and I said, no, this is not going to be me, you know, I mean, I, you don't know what war is like until you get in it, you know, and, and I said, I just should know what I'm doing. And those, those trainings were absolutely phenomenal. I know that uh, when I went to Vietnam, my first combat assault, I pulled out my Ranger handbook. I mean, I lived by my Ranger handbook. So Ranger training was first? Uh, airborne was first. Airborne. Yeah. So tell me that was, about that Airborne. That was, that was it. That's at Fort Benning. I don't know if you've ever seen Fort Benning and the jump towers down there. You know, we were in shape for that, so it didn't really, that wasn't a big deal. We got to jump out of planes. It was, we were strapped out and it was probably the only thing scary there was uh, night jumps. You know, when you jump at night, you don't really know where that ground is. <laughs> you know? You've never even been in an airplane before. Now you're jumping. No, I'm right jumping out, out of them. <laughs> you're right. And then I went to, uh, and Ranger was it was particularly difficult, but um, um, all these are confidence builders, you know, for young people, you need to have this sort of thing. And um, as I said, I, I live by my Ranger handbook. All the things I learned as a Ranger, I, I, I utilized. Was your airborne and Ranger training mostly in the field work or was it classroom? Mostly, or mostly field. Some some classroom, but almost mostly in the field. How did you get through that training? Did you find it grueling? Yeah, absolutely. And how did you get through it? It's interesting too, because you go through as an officer, but you're not an officer. <clears throat> you know, you still, you know, you don't you don't have that same feeling, and they don't treat you like that either. So there's no there's no favorites or anything. And I finished that. Um, graduated and I got sent to Fort Knox, um, Kentucky, for my first assignment. And usually I guess what they would do, they'd send lieutenants to get some stateside experience in whatever. And there I was, um, I was an executive officer for, a, I think it was a communication company. And I was in charge of, uh, usually what they have is the commander and then the first lieutenant, or the lieutenant in charge, XO, he takes care of all the other duties from mess hall to payroll to everything else. It's, you, you just get all the bad jobs. And it was, uh, it was, you know, that's what happens. So give me an example. What are some of the bad jobs? Well, one of the bad jobs is that you have to, you have to pay everybody. And I, I remember I had to pick up a bag of uh, money. Uh, it would be like 90000 in cash. And I'd have to break it down into everybody's paycheck. And then they'd have to come in and present themselves and I would make, give them their pay. So you'd have, you know, that wasn't fun to do every month because you're responsible for a lot of money. Oh, we were all, all we had was cash. We'd roll it up in their little thing. Um, I did uh, guard duty for the post at Fort Knox. Um, I mean, I was responsible for the guards at Fort Knox. They had a, well, I don't know if you can tell, a little off-color thing. It was, uh, I had a, uh, when, you, when you command uh, the guard post for the fort, um, the soldiers come and they stand in formation for you and you uh, inspect them. You always inspect the guards and be sure they know their orders, what they have to do before they go out on their post. And the officer in charge, which I would be, you'd have to pick someone, the best soldier out there, and they would call him a supernumerary. Maybe you've heard these stories before. He's supernumerary and he's the top guy. And he gets to go home. The next guy usually works with me throughout the night, you know, so... I looked out at the guys, and they weren't really ser serious. I could tell that, but one kid was really sharp. He was really strapped. His boots were clean, and he seemed to be caring about what he was doing. I'm thinking, I'm going to pick him. So I went down the line, inspecting each guy, and I see this kid, and he's standing there at attention, waiting for me. I came in front of him. He snaps up, and I, I he heard me talk to everyone before him, you know, and ask him all the general orders, and I was being as strict as I should be as an officer. 
<clears throat> inspecting them. And I came to him and I said, hi. And he wet his pants. <laughs> I felt so bad. I said, so I'm going inside. I was going to send you home anyway. Oh, but, you know, and I saw there was, there was three, three times in the Army I saw soldiers facing senior officers. And there's other guys that may have seen this happen before. They get very scared. It's a, it's a very different thing. You know, you don't, enlisted men don't get to deal with officers that much and um, unless they're right under them, you know. But at any rate, uh, that was my, my duty at Fort Knox. Probably the, the funnest thing I did, I had a chance to work with General Bastone, who was the uh, past post commander at Fort Knox. Commanded Fort Knox during the... Um, um, filming of the movie Goldfinger and he told me stories about that because he he'd never been in the depository and he had to get a special letter from the president to go in there just to see what it was all about but um, they asked me to be his aide for a week that they had there I think it was two weeks and as an aide I get to drive him around and his wife and take care of them I don't drive I mean we had a car and I got to hear stories that he had from the Second World War uh, he was a commander in, in in Europe in tanks. Now, Fort Knox is an armor place. And so I got to hear a lot of stories about armor and, and things like that. Um, it was just enjoyable to, to be with a general, I guess. That's that's my experience there. I never had that, that feeling before. Um, it, was, it, was, it was good. Uh, and near the end of my tour... Um, my wife's brother was killed. Well, my fiance's brother was killed in, in Vietnam, just south, just to the west of Da Nang. And I was asked to escort his body home, and uh, which is the privilege of the family. And I went to Dover Air Force Base and I picked up Butch and um, with the funeral director and we brought him home. And uh, in Connecticut, it was kind of in interesting because I hadn't known any other people that had died in Vietnam that that this was one in Meriden and there, the funeral home was just open seeing for hours and hours I stood there with the family doing that and and as an officer you present the flag to the family and after that I actually got a chance I was on TDY orders to go and <clears throat> bring other soldiers home I think I did five or six others on the on the east coast the east coast soldiers came into uh, Dover Air Force Base, and I don't know where they went on the West Coast. And I remember um, presenting the flag to families, and those experiences are something I'll never forget. I mean, I don't know the names, but, you know, to do that um, was, again, a big thing for a, a young guy. You know, I had, uh, this is before I went to Vietnam, you know, and the, I've had a lot of, I've had a lot of experience as a young guy now already. And I, um, that was I'm, an incredible honor, but that must have been very difficult as a young guy. That must have been it was, you know, I, and I remember it, you know, from, um, I, uh, from the President of the United States and Grateful Nation, I present this flag, you know, there was, a, there was a spiel that you said with each flag. And I remember each, each flag I would put three casings that from a 21 gun salute, I would tuck it into the flag, and one mother took the flag and she threw it at me. And she said that effing Nixon or someone, I forgot, she threw it at me. The the shells went down into the hole, into the, into the, the where they were gonna bury him. And I picked up the flag and I moved over and I said the same thing to the father. And he took the flag and apologized for his, for his wife. <clears throat> I couldn't, I couldn't, um, I, I, that's all I could do. You know, it was funny because during this period, if you remember, and uh, probably something that won't get recorded in all of your stuff, I'm not sure, but the feeling in the country at the time throughout that period um, was, was very different from what we have now today. <clears throat> Extremely unpopular war, as I think all wars should be. Um, but I remember being in college and people... Um, protesting, <clears throat> excuse me, and I remember thinking, I hope they make it, because I really hope they get in the war <laughs> before I have to go, but I mean, there was, uh, there was a lot of, um, I remember it was an era of hippies, of, hippie, of hippies and uh, that whole group, you know, um, 
I remember going to a, a rally against the war or something. Just actually, we went to meet girls, but uh, we went to some club in New York that was had tea or something, and it was just there were a bunch of beatniks. Man, remember that term also. All that stuff happened during that time, and I think drugs started to become more of a more of a, more of a function in America. LSD was the things people did. Um, but I remember going to a club and there's all these people that just after he protested, a bunch of girls, long hair, uh, drinking tea, and some guy with his drum saying, you know, you know, life is dead, you know, and he, people would snap. If we thought those girls were weird, you know, <laughs> we just said, get out of here. I mean, I don't know how to describe that, but it was it was a really crazy psychedelic era, and um, into that era was was Vietnam, and I think it it contributed to that era. You know, it's hard to describe because people that didn't go to Vietnam and didn't serve also had a confusing world back home. You know, the, the things that happened um, in the world, in, in our country, was, was different from what we were experiencing. And into that world we came home into. So it's not unusual to hear the stories of, of guys that came home and the things that happened to me when I came home. To, to have, for them to have those feelings, it was perpetrated by the by the, the by the whole Vietnam uh, era conflict, which wasn't all in Vietnam. Um, how long did you stay at Fort Knox? Uh, less than a year. And then did you go right over to Vietnam? No, I, I got I got a quick leave, went home. Um, I asked my wife and my fiance, my wife, to marry me. And, Looks like uh, she said yes. She did. <laughs> she did. And uh, and then that they sent me down to Panama. I went to jungle school in Panama. I think they sent a lot of us officers down to, to get acclimated to the to the temperature in Vietnam, which was true. It was the same. And I had a chance to I uh, learned uh, jungle warfare down there. What was that like? That was uh, it, again good training. I mean, I I got to see, you know, when you when you train in the states, you do things like at night you get in a sleeping bag and go to bed, or you uh, cover yourself up somewhere in the jungle. We had uh, hammocks that we never saw them in Vietnam either, but very uncomfortable things to to live with. You know, we we did things like they made they gave us uh, different ways and things to eat. Something I learned there was. Um, in bamboo, you know, there are different sections in bamboo and there's liquid in there. And one time in Vietnam, we were uh, socked in on the top of the hilltop with a lot of bamboo around us, but we couldn't get water. And I knew that if we went down into the valley, we called it the blue, where there was water, we could fill up our canteens and we'd be okay. Instead, we were waiting for resupply, which couldn't come because of the rain and the mist and all that stuff. So I told the guys about this bamboo thing and you can get uh, liquid out of it, you know. Again, there's my training, you know. And uh, sure enough, if you if you take each section, there's about that much liquid in each one. It takes a while to fill up a canteen cup, and the stuff sort of looks like spit, but it's liquid and it keeps you alive. And and we did that. It was interesting because water was water was key in Vietnam. I mean, it, it was it was very often you would you would fill up your canteen in a mud puddle. Um, and you look forward to a mud puddle. And we had tabs you put in to, to fix your water, but um, it was uh, you, water was key. I mean, we carried our rucksacks were all all weighed over 100 pounds, and most of it was water. I mean, I carried as many as 14 quarts at one time of water, and some of them like little pillows filled with water and on your thing, and, and uh, it, you needed water. You just you needed water as bad as you needed bullets. How long did you stay in Panama for that training? Oh, that wasn't that long. It was maybe a couple of weeks, maybe three at the most, I guess. And we went to Vietnam from there. You went right from Panama to Vietnam. Yeah, but Vietnam. But Panama was interesting. I mean, I, um, I actually got hurt a little bit. I hurt my shoulder a little in an injury uh, crossing a river. You know, they had these river crossings, and um, just you're, you're in a sort of a harness and the way you stop is you just hit a big knot at the other end of the rope 
and sort of damaged my shoulder a little bit. Not bad enough, I was hoping, <laughs> but <laughs> to go home. <laughs> to go home, but it wasn't that bad. So I showed up in Vietnam in a sling. I was. Uh, I said, "Well, this is good. Maybe I'm going to get a desk job somewhere." <laughs> you know. Where did you land in Vietnam? Uh, Long Bin. What was your first impression on landing? It was hot. Now you know we're scared. I mean, really, and you don't, and you just don't know what's happening. And um, people around us would. You sort of get laughed at a little bit because you knew they call them cherries, and uh, we would be. Uh, getting off the plane. It was very hot and humid. I remember we went to a, an induction station of some kind where we were going to get our orders. I'm thinking, why isn't anyone looking at me in my, in my sling? <laughs> Didn't make any difference. I was assigned to the 101st Airborne and I went, uh, I was shipped up to uh, Camp Eagle, which is where you get what they call search, which is Screaming Eagle training something or other. And uh, you learn how to how the uh, the standard operating procedures, the SOP for the for 101st Airborne. We talk a different way. We we had certain uh, uh, patrolling procedures, and we actually patrolled while we were in Camp Eagle. While I was in Camp Eagle, it was interesting. I remember being in line for the mess hall, and you really stood about, you know, I would guess what is that, maybe five, ten feet from the next person. We wouldn't be right in line for obvious reasons. I remember being in line and two guys up from me got shot by a sniper while I'm there in the leg. And um, so you start to believe the training, you know, that we were told to spread out like this and it made sense. And I remember, uh, uh, I remember that guy going down and we scattered after that. Every night we were there, we got rockets would come in and you would have to leave your, your bunk and you'd go into a bunker on the side. Um, don't know why they shot rockets and never even hit anything, but it was still something we had to hide from. They they mostly aimed at the air base in Fubai. And um, then I went on my first uh, assignment where you, you're, you're flown to uh, a, uh, what they call it, the Tactical Operations Center, which is the head of a, well, I guess a battalion headquarters. And there you meet the colonel and he assigned you to a company and, a, and, and the company commander there would assign you to a platoon. And am I going on too much? No, absolutely. <laughs> I sat there and I remembered that I, um, I flew in, I landed on fire base and I met the colonel and I was Do supposed to- Do you recall to the name of the fire base? I want to say Tomahawk, but I may be wrong. It probably wasn't Tomahawk. Uh, it'll, it may occur to me. Okay. It, it wasn't a, 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 at any rate, I flew in there and I met the colonel. And actually, we were, we were kind of high. All fire bases are sort of on hills. And what happens is a battalion takes a fire base and all the different companies within a battalion surround the fire base and, and uh, patrol that area. And each company has four or five platoons s surrounding that there. So we were search and destroy was our mission around a fire base when we got to it just after i met with the colonel it, this wasn't funny but i mean i thought of it later on it's funny i'm sitting there and all of a sudden we're taking fire we're all on a fire base looking over down at the battle way down the end and uh i don't it was up in an area called the rock pile some guys will know i don't know if you've heard that term before but it was it was near the rock pile and um uh, while we were watching it, we, we took sniper fire from an area over the side. And I remember hitting the ground like we all did. <clears throat> and I'm thinking, you know, this is what you do. Obviously, I'm going to hit the ground. And I remember hearing <laughs> bullets going by me. And then I hear <laughs> thump, thump, thump all around me. And I don't know how to describe this, but you really want to hug the ground closer than the ground lets you hug it. You know, you want to get lower. And I mean, they were they were landing all around me, and I said, "Ah, the fire base opened up on the, on the sniper to let us move move out of firing range." And the colonel asked if uh, someone wanted to take a patrol down there and and get the sniper. And I wasn't in a volunteering mood, but I did. I I was pissed. 
I said, why would someone want to kill me? That was the first notice. No shit, I ever got that someone might want to kill me, you know? It's a real strange feeling. It's a, it's a revelation of some kind, you know? And I, uh, I got uh, a Jeep at, on Firebase, and, and I don't know if you've ever seen uh, 90 millimeter recallless rifle. Some people would call them bazookas in, in previous wars, but it's, they're, they're used mainly to kill uh, armor vehicles. Now, we had no armor to kill over there, so this, this fire ordinance would pile up on the fire bases. You know, all the, all the ammunition and the tubes would be just sitting there. So I loaded up a Jeep with two Jeeps with a trailer with the, the ammunition and the, the tubes. And we surrounded this area, and I told my guys, I said, we're not going back until we fire every piece of, of ordinance we have here. And it was high explosive and white phosphorus and everything. It was a mixture of stuff. And we burned, I'd say, the fire had started there, and it burned It burned for maybe three or four days. But I'm saying three or four acres. Maybe not that big. But wherever that sniper was, he was he was contained in that area. <clears throat> and I know I got him. But I remember coming back up the hill, and the colonel goes, he goes, Lieutenant, says, you, you, you think you got him? I said, I know, sir. He's trying to kill us. And he goes, geez, you were really pissed, weren't you? He said, yeah. And he thanked me. He said, thanks. He said, I felt the same way, too. Um, that was just my first experience of getting shot at. It was it was weird, you know. I went, um, after that, I was assigned to a platoon and uh, a company, Company B, uh, second platoon. I became, I was going, and, and another fire base. And there I was, um, I was waiting to do, to, to report to my platoon, which was out in the field. Unbeknownst to me, they're under fire. Um, shortly after that, <clears throat> now you're really just alone on the fire base. There's no one to really talk to. You know, there's guys on guard duty and people doing what they're doing. And I was down in the, the tactical operations center on the ground. It's called a TOC. And there's a fire base going on, a firefight going on. And i uh, come to find out that the lieutenant that I was going to replace, he was getting to go home. D-Rose is a term we used to go home. And um, do the end of service, I think it stood for. And and I, um, I he was killed in that firefight, and along with uh, five other guys. They, they extracted that platoon and they brought him on the fire base to refit him. And <clears throat> I was introduced as the new platoon leader. That was really, really difficult because I knew that these guys were looking at me as a, as a butter bar. Now, I'm, you get, you, I got promoted to first lieutenant and I knew I, they knew I was new and I knew I was a cherry over there and they, you know, they knew I couldn't have known what I was supposed to know. Um, and I remember, again, grabbing my, my ranger handbook. And uh, I was to talk to these guys, but my, we had a fire mission. We were actually going back in the same area. I was supposed to take them back. I don't know if you know what a, a saddle in a hill is. It's two hills and it comes down together. You know, it, it's called a saddle and that's where the fire effect took place. And they were going to put me back in there. Do you know where that was in Vietnam? It was right by the rock, rock pile, somewhere in that area. And... Um, and then there was some lowlands underneath it. I remember I gave my warning orders, orders to everything. And the funny thing is that, um, this is again kind of off color, but I'm sure other guys had that experience. We didn't wash there, you know, we, there was no way to get clean. And when I first met with my, my platoon sergeants and everybody and tell them what I wanted to do, I'm, I'm smelling something. It smells like, do you ever step in dog poop in someone's house and you walk in, who stepped it? You smell it. That's what we smelled like. You know, you can't put that in pictures anywhere, but we stunk. And uh, they were laughing because they knew I was smelling it because, you know, it wasn't soon long after that that I smelled like that too. And uh, I gave them the warning order and we took off and we're heading down the hill. I remember to get on the helicopter and I'm walk walking with my platoon and uh, all of a sudden everybody stopped and I'm still walking. <clears throat> and I got down to the... the, the the pad, and it turns out that um, there were all the body bags for the guys that they pulled out were sitting down there, on, ready to be extracted. The bodies don't go first if there's supply needs. You know, the, the helicopters come in, and they, but the, the, those guys were there. 
And I turned around and looked at the guys, and they're all staring at, at the bags there. And, uh, I'm, and then I looked down, and I saw that. And I remember the major coming down the hill who was in charge. He was not very good at what he was doing, and he didn't, he hadn't planned well. And he screwed up a little bit later. I'll tell you about that. But I remember coming down and and he told me to get my guys down. I said, I said, I said sir, you know, this is the situation. And he was sort of insensitive. And I don't know where it came from because, again, I'm a young kid, but I yelled at him. And I told him, I said, these guys are looking at their buddies here in the bags. I said, why would you do something like this? You know, why would you send them down there in this situation? And he sort of shut up. In a way, it sort of ingratiated with myself with the guys because they knew then that I was going to stand up for them. I, I didn't do it for that reason, but I did it because I thought it was wrong, you know, that they should have left it there. <clears throat> so the, I'm going out on my first combat assault. I got up in the um, chopper and this sortie of, I think it was six of us, six, six Hueys, and they put us down in this field and I know it's not where I'm supposed to be, but there's no way to communicate with the pilot. I'm sitting on the edge of the chopper, you know, there's no doors. And he set us down and I remember everybody did what they were supposed to do. They set up a perimeter after they let us down. And um, I asked all the platoon sergeants to report to me. I said, listen guys, I said, you know, when we, when I call in this location, I was, I said, uh, uh, I, I need to tell you that no one's going to believe me because I'm a, I'm a brand new first lieutenant here, and they're going to think I'm full of it. I said, but this is what we're going to do. I, so this is my first chance to train, train the guys, which I believed a lot in. I said, uh, I want all of you to go back and do a. What you do is a cross at me. You take terrain features that you can see on your map with your compass and with the with the lines cross on your map. It's where you are. I said, well, I want you to do that, and then we're going to call in that location together. So they all did it. We all came with the same location. You know, I, there's a special way to code the information on the radio. And I called it in, and they were listening to me, and sure enough, they didn't believe where I was. I mean, I could see where I was about three kilometers away. I was in the wrong place. So uh, it was around 4, four 5 o'clock, 16, 1700. And I remember I said, told the guys just to dig in for the night, you know, we'll set up here, we'll, we'll, we'll head to where we're supposed to go. I have no other choice. That's where they wanted me. So we'll head there tomorrow. We'll, you know, it took, actually took me a couple of days to get there. That's how far away it was. Did you have to walk there? Did the helicopter Oh, no, we, we walked everywhere. <laughs> we walked. Anyway, but we set up for the night. The next morning, I'm taking fire. I mean, explosions all around us. Like, what the hell is this? You know, <laughs> here's another thing going on already in um, I called in for fire support, and I called it to, to the, the battalion, and they they set uh, Hueys out. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, um, Cobras out. And what you do is you pop smoke, and you identify the direction of of the enemy from there. And I pop smoke, and I identify the azimuth, and I see the helicopter circling the saddle where it was supposed to be. And all of a sudden, I hear on the radio, it goes, you're not here. I said, that's what I told him yesterday. I said, I said, check out my new location. And I, he could see the smoke. He flies down over the smoke. It turns out we're downrange from an art, from a armor unit. They were blowing off some rounds. Friendly fire. No, we didn't get hurt, and we were okay. They stopped, stopped everything, but you know, welcome to Vietnam, Bill, you know. <laughs> and from that point on, everyone, I think the guys had, I had their support anyway. They knew I, I knew what I was talking about. And from there on, without any orders, I just headed for that location and recorded my position. At, and I think it was kind of hushed up around the talk area because I think they, they realized they'd made a mistake. And I was just going back up in that area on my own. Um, and my patrolling pretty much went like that every day. We had, <clears throat> we set up, night defensive positions, NDPs every night, every night. I'm an infantry officer, so that's what you do, you know. Um, you set out Claymore mines every night, and you set up uh, your, your guard posts and everything. And we're, and we're just, it's hard to describe this, we're just sleeping on the ground, you know. That's the way life is there, you know. And I remember, uh, that's what they don't teach you in training. You know, you don't know where you're going to be at night. You know, you, you think you're going to get a good night's sleep, and it's not never happened. Be, well, in some cases it did, but... How um, large a group were you in charge of? 
44. So this small group, 44 men, that's how you travel every single day, walking to the next place? Mm -hmm. um, I didn't, I, I didn't, for the most part, for about six months, I don't think I came out of the field once. I think we were always out there. Um, so every single night you would every, be setting out claymores and on patrol out in the field? Every night, every night. And what we would do is, We'd set up the claymores, and I would call in, um, uh, they call them defensive targets. We would identify them as Delta Tango, defensive target, and a number. And what you would do is I would set up defensive targets to where I was going to go the next day. So if I got in trouble, I could call defensive target 2 or whatever it is and direct fire from that. I could get high explosive right away without adjusting it very much. And that's where... I guess my love of the artillery and indirect fire came in because I got, got a chance to do all of that. Every night I had to call in 125 defensive targets and I, I ranged them from where I was the night before. I blew up that area. Um, I blew up other areas that I thought the enemy might approach and I uh, set defensive targets where I was going to go tomorrow. I'd always blow up my last position wherever I was. and. As, the, as my term went on, I used to train. I, every night I'd take a guy in the platoon and teach him how to do exactly what I was doing so that if I got hurt or something, someone would be able to pick up the radio and, and get, some, you know, get some heat on us right away. And the guys were good about that. Um, but as, as the six, within that first six months, uh, the monsoon season, season comes. And monsoon season is interesting because during that season, it rain, it drizzles every day. Every day it drizzles, and it's sort of a mist some days. And some days it rains, so it's, it's either one or the other, drizzle or rain. <clears throat> and in those days, I remember tons of times you just sort of lay in the in the, the jungle floor, or in some cases mud, and you put a poncho over your face so that you can sleep a little bit, you know. But other than that, we you know, you got wet. We were wet all the time, and. Um, just a miserable feeling. You know, You know, if you ever went camping here, you know, you can go home at night, take a shower and all that. It, it wasn't going to happen like that. You know, we just going to, you were wet and miserable and you were going to stay wet and miserable. And at the same time, people wanted to shoot at us, you know. So it was, we would patrol every single day. Um, we had situations where we did get into a, um, I guess my first bad one was an, a, an ambush where we were ambushed. Is this what you wanted to talk about? Yes. Can um, you go ahead and describe that? We were getting, I, when we patrolled, I would, I would send uh, one platoon out ahead of me. I would w usually walk with the second platoon, and the third, third platoon and fourth platoon would rest, uh, and they'd cover our rear until we found a new position where we were going to be in. And we were at a time when we had just discovered where we wanted to be, and so I had my other platoons coming up behind me, and we're in line, if you, if you can imagine that, but spread out over quite a distance. And um, all of a sudden, we started taking fire from the front, more than just one, several. We didn't know, you, know, you don't see the enemy, but we're taking fire pretty good. And I had been, um, I had been instructed, this is what you do in an ambush, if you can imagine, you know, you're trapped. Sometimes, if you think of an ambush, you, you can imagine that. But the only way out of an ambush is if you fire a lot of firepower in the direction of where you're being fired. That's that's the standard procedure to do that. And these guys did it. They did everything they were supposed to do. You know, you just you blast everything you got in that direction, and you move back to to where you're safe. And we did that. We we made it. Um, we had one one KIA that day, and. That was my first, you know, first kill, if you will. Who knows who got it, but, you know, we got them. But there was more than one. There were several. And uncomfortably, we were told to follow the trail after that. I <laughs> didn't really want to follow them, but <clears throat> we did. And, and that, that's pretty much, you know, the activities we did every day. Every day was search and destroy. Um, we didn't, we weren't in combat every day. Lots of days we were just, you know, humping along. You'd find uh, old bunkers, 
uh, where we would blow them up. If we found a place where we found some caches of weapons, um, some of them we would we would send back on resupply, and some of them we would just destroy in place. Um, we would be moving. Sometimes, sometimes we'd move pretty far. A kilometer is pretty far to walk. Uh, I mean, in a day there, I mean, you could easily walk a kilometer here, but a kilometer there through the jungle and through the what we called, uh, uh, we all carried machetes, so we would cut and brush and everything as we went through. We called uh, guys that ever watched this, they'll know about wait a minute vines. You carry, you're walking through the jungle with your rock and everything, and all of a sudden a vine will catch your pack and you say, oh, wait a minute, we'll pull you back a little bit. <laughs> I don't know, we had stupid names for everything. We had wait a minute vines, we had we had a Monday, Monday pill, an everyday, everyday pill, and we had stupid things that we used to talk about. Um, our medics were really young kids, 19-year-old kids that took care of us medically, you know. You forget that in a, in a, in a war, in, in these situations, you know, people get headaches and toothaches and colds and things that everyone else gets, you know, and you have to deal with them out there. There's no, there's no not coming to work, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> And we all got scratched and cut up quite a bit. Um, remember, we're really pretty dirty. And I mean, really disgustingly dirty. How far would you travel in a day? What was a typical amount of... The most we, I ever think I've traveled was a kilometer. Um, but uh, lots of times, if you've looked at the maps of Vietnam, I don't know if you've read maps, but the small lines, it'll indicate a steep hills and stuff. So when you're climbing a hill, it could take you all day to go, maybe... Uh, 200 meters, you know, and it won't look like anything from the map, but it may be a steep hill like that that you went up. So, you know, it'd be, it would look like you, you didn't go anywhere, but sometimes, you know, I know I, I turned my report in at the end of the day when I called it to, to uh, my commander. He wondered why we didn't go so far. I said, sir, take a look at the area. We, we went up, you know, and he wasn't good at materializing that in his head from where he was, but um, I'm sure he knew what I was talking about. And so, as I said, sometimes it was steep, and sometimes we didn't go very far. But you don't go fast anyway. I mean, it's careless to move fast. 